we had also been going on three years without contract with our union. A lot of my veteran co-workers there, they hadn't gotten a raise in over three years. And by contract, we were supposed to be getting a raise every six months. There have been people working there five, ten years without getting a single raise to begin with. Hey, fellow workers. My name is Kim Sieber. Welcome back to another episode of the Alberta Worker Podcast. You are tuning in to Season 3, Episode 7. The Alberta Worker Podcast is a proud member of the Labor Radio Network, as well as the Harbinger Media Network. We're broadcasting from the territory of the Nisapi. And today's guest is Ruperetta Valentina, or as she likes to be known by her close friends and family, Ruby. And Ruby is a concierge. Ruby, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Kim. Thanks for having me. You betcha. So we'll just go straight into it. We'll just have you share with me and the listeners, you know, your life story, where you grew up, what your family life was like, where you went to school, that sort of thing. And then as well, your personal labor history, your first job, subsequent jobs, and what you're doing now, and you know, the process you took to get there. And you can either integrate them or do them separately. But the floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Kim. So a little bit about me is I am a soon to be 37 year old trans woman. Born and raised here in Lethbridge. I lived out in Coaldale for a good portion of my life. So from age 5 to 15, I was living out in Coaldale, but essentially still part of Lethbridge and whatnot. Yeah, and just so people who don't know, Coaldale is just like a bedroom community of Lethbridge. Pretty much, yeah. Like when I was living there, it was small. I had a couple of fast food restaurants, had a really great local pizza place called Delos Pizza. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, they had to close down, but they had a really good run there. My dad used to be co-workers with the brother of the owner, Nick, back when my dad was working for the now defunct Canadian Regional Airlines, which was a charter airline. So they would fly Dash 8s and service smaller airports like down in the U.S. and Montana. Montana, Idaho, Washington State, and then here, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and BC, right. and of course, Alberta as well. So I did grow up around planes, which is why even though I don't have my pilot's license, I am an avid aviator. Okay, cool. It's kind of like how some people grow up around boats all the time. So they either develop a fondness for boats or a great loathing for them. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, basically Lethbridge born and raised. I've seen all the changes that have happened in Lethbridge. Went to school out in Coldell at St. Joseph's School, which was quite the experience. And I wish I could say it was a good one, but unfortunately, it was very traumatic for me. It really put into emphasis just how broken my own family has been. You know, like even though my parents are still together, have been for 38 years, nice. both my parents were emotionally distant. You know, my mom was a workaholic working, you know, sometimes five jobs at a time to oh, try wow. to give me a better life. Unfortunately, what I needed and what she was giving me weren't the same thing. And so I grew up very alienated from my parents, even though they did try. And fortunately, when I needed their protection, they were nowhere around to protect me. So I was forced to grow up really fast at a very young age okay. when it came to dealing with bullies and harassment at school. As mentioned, I am a trans woman. I first realized that I was trans when I was three years old, uh -huh. but not having been exposed to trans culture, I had no idea what it was. And I thought that I was alone in that feeling. Like I didn't even know what a trans person was until I was about 11, 12 years old. Right. Doing what teen boys usually do when they have the house all to themselves. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't an adult until I found out that gay people existed. And I went to high school in the 80s. Yeah. Nobody I knew in my high school was queer. And as far as I know, even to this day, only two of us were queer, me and some other person. But I wasn't out then. Like, oh, yeah. I didn't realize it until almost five years ago that I was queer. But the other person I knew, he didn't come out until five years after we graduated. So nobody we knew was out in high school. So it was just not something I was exposed to until I was an adult. Yeah, that's how it is with a lot of people in our community. Especially the older ones. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 The Gen Xers and the boomers and whatnot. Yeah. You know, but hey, times are changing and, yeah. you know, they're able to adapt. They're able to live their authentic self. So, you know, more power to them. Yeah, absolutely. So like it wasn't until I was about 9, 10, 11 years old when I started embracing my more feminine side, but mostly just 
I was still keeping myself pretty well in the closet because right. like growing up with a dominantly Catholic family on one side and Dutch Mennonite on the other. And it's like, okay, I'm hearing a lot of this and a lot of that. So I'm not sure just how much support I would have, you know, and especially considering my own family members would tease and bully me about it about like me being effeminate looking, yep. you know, and this was because at the time I was on Ritalin for my ADHD. So it would suppress my appetite. I actually had a fairly high metabolism rate when I was younger. So it's like, well, can you blame me for not putting on any muscle mass? You know, like you guys are drugging me up and it's having physiological effects on me, not just the mental effects, you know? So I was embracing my femininity, but still trying to keep it pretty secretive. So I started slowly building up my own wardrobe in secret. And I was 14 years old when my mom discovered my alternate wardrobe. I tried to pass it off, you know, still trying to play up the masculine side, which actually hurt me in the long run because, you know, thinking back, I realized that in my effort to embrace the masculinity, I would take it too far and, you know, become like really toxic in my masculinity. And yeah trying to fit in with the rest of the boys in my class and all that who were doing yeah. the same stuff and that was me and internalized homophobia as well oh yeah totally yeah you know and so it's like on days when my toxic masculinity was at its worst i would spend hours at night crying myself to sleep like why am i hurting like this later on i realized that oh it's because by hurting the girls in my class with my words i'm also hurting myself because this is not who i am who i actually am is this scared little girl you know who's trying to get out of the closet by the time i was 14 you know i fully embraced that i was trans even though i still had no idea that i was trans didn't even hear the word transgender until well after 2005 when i actually had internet at home right i was relying on antiquated and archaic terms that some members in the trans community have reclaimed others it still leaves a foul taste in their mouth you know so like you know terms like shemale and transsexual and whatnot you know i was still using those terms because I didn't know any better. Yeah. And it was 2005. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, 2005. And I was getting most of my information about the trans community from erotic magazines. That's the media that I had right. on hand. Yeah. So when I was 14, my mom had made a comment about some male garter snakes will develop female sex characteristics as a form of protection, right? So like they'll swap genders to protect themselves. It's usually the smaller males, you yeah. know, they'll secrete female pheromones to draw the bigger males towards them to form a mating ball to protect the smaller males from uh, predators. Oh, wow. So I kind of used that as a stepping stone to try to come out as a trans girl when I was 14. But unfortunately, my mom brushed it off uh -huh. and said, no, no, you're just a cross dresser. Okay, well, fine. You're the parent. I'm the child. Because like, that's kind of how I was brought up. Children are to be seen, not heard. Even though it's the 90s, it's no wonder millennials are so loud and obnoxious because everybody's trying to silence us. Or well, not silence us, but like keep us quiet kind of thing. Right. So then come high school, we moved back into Lethbridge proper and I attended Catholic Central High School and I was still embracing my feminine side. But I had to be extremely careful of it because when I was in grade 10, this was close to the end of the year, the principal made a summary rule stating that anyone dressing or expressing gender outside of the gender they were assigned at would be summarily expelled. Oh my goodness. What year was this? Uh, this was 2002, 2003. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was in grade 10 at the time, even though it would have been academic suicide for me to break that rule. It was the only rule in high school that I thumbed my nose at a lot. Okay. You know, I'd wear like women's socks and women's underwear under my regular clothes. Uh, I'd paint my toenails. Okay. Wear feminine stuff that I could easily hide so no one would be none the wiser. And I was always very careful as to what days I would wear it. You know, like I'd avoid doing it when I had gym class. Right. Okay. CCH is on the quarter system. So if I was in the quarter that had gym class, I would avoid, you know, my cross dressing and whatnot, you know, to make sure I don't give anything away. Right. It was the one rule I thumbed at in high school and it helped me get better at not falling into toxic masculine behaviors. Right. 
I wouldn't have been able to make it through high school if I hadn't thumbed my nose at that rule. And it especially helped me become an honor student in high school as well. So like I graduated with honors. Nice. I did not. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Uh, my dad didn't graduate with honors either. You know, he was good, but he wasn't like honor roll material. And my mom didn't even finish high school. So. Oh, okay. So leading the way for the family. Oh, yeah. Yeah, nice. definitely. You know, trying to end the generational abuse and yes. whatnot, like by hook or by crook, the generational abuse ends with me. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's even why I changed my last name, trying to distance myself from my blood relations. Okay. You've seen me speak at some of the local rallies and whatnot, and I'd introduce myself as Rup Retta or Ruby Miklos. Well, some recent events have happened, not uh, outside of my control, but within the control of my mother who actually put me in this compromising situation involving housing. And so that was the final straw. And it's like, okay, I'm distancing myself from my family and I'm changing not just my first name, but middle name and last name as well. And managed to get that done back in April. I'm just waiting on my new birth certificate, but uh, StatsCan is apparently running behind because they said it would be up to a month before I got it. And I'm going on month two now, so... So this is really new for you then, the, the legal name change? Oh, well, kind of, sort of, yeah. Like going full tilt is new, but this is actually my second process trying to get my name changed because oh, okay. I first tried changing my name back in um, 2021. At the time I was working at Loblaws. After my first month there, I get a call from my department head and human resources telling me that apparently the store hired on too many employees for the Christmas rush. They gave me an option either to quit outright or to stay on at reduced hours. And I was already working part time. Well, when I had applied, I was told it would be a permanent position. Right. So to get this phone call, you know, first week of January saying, yeah, you can either stay on at reduced hours because we can't afford to pay you part time or you can quit outright. And it's like, and foolish me. I said, well, I really want the job. I mean, I'm already on age, but like having a job helps occupy my time, you know, because just sitting at home, it gets boring after a while, especially when all my other friends are busy with work themselves and whatnot. So it's like, I need something to occupy the hours. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Still, it doesn't sound like a win-win situation for you. It turned out not to be a win-win situation. I mean, don't get me wrong. I loved what I did. I loved being a concierge, getting to know my regular customers. And like, I even went on to become a favorite Kirby of some of the customers. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. W working in PCX at the Superstore was the best job I ever had. Hmm. Company policy in regards to the treatment of the employees I definitely could have done without. And what does a concierge do at Superstore? Okay, so concierge works in their PCX, which is uh, President's Choice Express. Their job is to answer the phones and confirm orders for pickup. It also includes the runners who go out and pick the orders, or well, we call them pickers, right? So we go out and pick the orders, right, and fulfill the orders. And then we've got the Kirby's who run the orders out to the customers when they come to pick it up. Right. Okay. Kirby's are also responsible for answering phones as well, because sometimes the concierge will be busy checking the orders and printing off confirmation slips and whatnot. So sure. Kirby's would also help answer phones and print stuff off. I wonder if you ever did my orders. I, I haven't used PC Express for a while, but for a little while, maybe about a year or so, I was using it almost every time I went grocery shopping. So, oh, oh, probably. Actually, yeah, I I think your wife came to pick them up, so I probably oh. filled filled out a few of oh, your okay. orders and brought okay. them out to your wife when she came to pick them up. Okay. I know I've fulfilled a couple orders for some local friends of mine, and nice. Yeah, I stopped using it because I'm pretty particular about some, like the bananas. I have to get certain size and stuff and certain color. Oh, and... yeah. Yeah, no, I get. Yeah. <laughs> so I stopped using it. I mean, it was pretty handy just showing up there, loading my vehicle, and then I just take off. It's like five minutes or whatever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Unless, of course, we're behind and because everybody decides they have to show up sure. at the exact same time. Yeah. My first day in PCX, it was both a baptism and trial by fire. <laughs> We were already behind by the time my shift started, right? And this was supposed to be my training day. And it literally became the movie training day. Had one customer threaten me to the point that it triggered my borderline personality disorder and my PTSD all at once. So it's like, okay, I need someone to go deal with this customer for me. He's 
being very hostile. And if I don't get away from him, I'm going to return the hostility. Goodness. Uh, first day on the job, and I'd already be fired for behavior unbecoming. <laughs> I managed to pull through. I had a lot of great coworkers working in PCX, you know, and it was a really great job. But about halfway through my eight months at Superstore, I was actually tapped by one of the associate store managers to work in the meat department. Oh. He saw all the good work I was doing in PCX, and he thought that my skill would be able to transfer over to the meat department and that I'd be able to do for the meat department what I was doing for PCX. Oh, cool. Unfortunately, he and I both realized that would not be the case. Oh, because the meat department at our local superstore actually had the highest turnover rate, not just for clerks, but for department heads as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, because I often will see people come out from the back and I don't recognize the same person twice. It always seems to be a different person. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's because the associate manager in charge of the meat department was on such a power trip. He doesn't realize that being a stalker, right, being a clerk in produce or meat department or whatever is actually a team effort, right? And so if one right. person slack, you can't expect the next person to pick up that slack and maintain theirs at the same time. It's yeah. just going to be a circular domino effect where the slack will never get made back up, you know, unless the person who created the slack in the first place picks up theirs. But he kept pressuring me to improve my time management, even though it's like, okay, look, I follow in order all my tasks, what I have to do. When it comes to this one task, though, which was keeping the fresh wall stocked, which included going into the walk-in freezer and getting frozen foods to put on the fresh wall. It's like, okay, if I have to go digging for this because it's still on the pallet and the pallets aren't organized that I can actually see the labels, like if I have to go and move a bunch of stuff to get to the product, like even in the walk-in cooler itself, if what I need is down at the very bottom, underneath everything, that means I have to move a lot of stuff and then move it back once I get what I need. And that eats up a lot of my time. So it's like, how can I manage it any better when there's a task within the task that I have to do, you know, where I actually have to be in three places at once. When I was working there, my store was always run on less than a skeleton crew, like okay. less than the bare minimum to make it function. Right. You know, so a lot of my other coworkers were burning out. When I transferred to the meat department, I actually met and got to know one of the overnight employees. And they told me that, yeah, I work nights and then I go to school during the day and I'm running on maybe one, two hours of sleep and uh, enough caffeine to put down an African bull elephant. You know, okay, so this store is basically the insane asylum, you know, because everybody is so dysfunctional that it's normal, not not to be ableist or anything. It's just like, that's my perspective kind of thing. Right. And how long were you at Superstore for? I was there for eight months. Okay. When did you finish there? I finished the end of July. I basically took two personal days off, wrote my letter of resignation on the second day off and officially quit first or second of August of uh, 2021. Okay. Because I couldn't handle the way it was being run. Don't get me wrong. The manager himself was a decent enough guy and many of the other ASMs were good, but I just couldn't handle the ASM in charge of the meat department and his power trip, right? I couldn't handle him you know, targeting me for my slack when I was also having to pick up the slack of the people, you know, working the shift before me and whatnot, you know, and then him telling me that I had to pick up my slack, you know, like I was literally doing the job of three people by myself. Right. But he wouldn't acknowledge it. He wouldn't see it. He even asked me, how are you doing the job of three people at once? And like, well, if you actually came into the meat department a little more often in the mornings and see what's been going on, take a look inside the walk-in cooler, not just gaze in and say, oh yeah, everything's where it should be kind of thing, you know, but actually look and like take stock. Right. Okay. Now I see where Ruby is having issues Yeah. and whatnot. Let's see if I can't rectify this on my end and improve the overall efficiency of the meat department as a whole. I think we may have skipped a few years. So what happened between high school and superstore? Oh, yes. Yes, we did. <laughs> we did skip a bunch of years. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. My tism has me going all over the place. That's fine. That, that's why it's moderated. I'm so lesbian, I could never tell a straight story. It's always got to go <laughs> everywhere and tangents all over the place. 
it's it's like trying to look at at a timeline using uh, spaghetti theory. Sure. Okay, so uh, right, I got my first job working at Green's Pop Shop on the north side oh, in the Bottle okay. Depot when I was in high school. I uh, started in grade twelve, about two thousand five, where I also ended up doing the job of two to three people by myself. Oh, wow. You know, especially during the summer, because here there's a correlation between the hottest days of the year and when the Bottle Depot is the busiest. And the smelliest. Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like Dave Green, he wouldn't close down the Bottle Depot to have it fumigated, even if not doing so was in violation of health laws. Oh, God. Yeah. So that was my first job. I started off as casual labor, you know, like coming in and my pay would go on to my mom's pay and she would reimburse me for it. Oh, was she working there as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. She was actually pulling double duty as both a cashier at night working for a midnight because this was back when it was open 24 hours. Oh, it's not anymore? Not that I know of. Okay. All right. I went in and it's like they close at like midnight now or, or something like that. So. Okay. So your mom was working there as she worked two shifts or two jobs, you said there? Yeah, pretty much. She would work as a cashier occasionally, uh, but at the time she was just working the one job in the bottle depot when I was the uh, casual laborer. After high school, I actually was working as an actual employee in the bottle depot because then my mom transferred over to cashier inside the store. But sometimes my mom would still pull double duty and work in the bottle depot as well if she was needed. But as I mentioned, my mom is a workaholic, so if she can get the money for it, she's not going to turn it down, even if she should for health reasons. Sure. And then after Greens? Okay. Uh, so after Greens, my mom got me a job that I only lasted one day at. It was doing concrete work. Oh, yeah. Working for a contractor who pours concrete for basements and stuff like right. that and foundations yeah. and whatnot. It was too physically demanding for me. Yeah, I can imagine. But I only lasted one day. Yeah, I worked in construction just after high school with my dad. It wasn't concrete. It was walls and ceilings like drywall and acoustic ceiling tiles oh, and yeah. stuff. But that was rough. I can't imagine pouring concrete. That'd be a really grueling job. Oh, it gets better. And by better, I mean it gets more grueling from there. All right. My mom then got me a job with a roofing company. Uh, small local roofing company. The husband of her, one of her co-workers at Greens was one of the co-owners of. It was a TWR Roofing. Oh, yeah. I've heard of them. So I was working with them. I was on a two-week probationary period. I only lasted one week. Oh. Because, like I said, grueling, grueling work. Yeah. You know, 40-degree heat and then dealing with hot tar if we were working on a flat or less than 20-degree slant roofs. And that 40 degree heat is reflected off those dark tiles. Oh, yeah. Shingles, I should say. Yep. Yep. The shingles, the tar paper, the fire paper, the tar itself, especially when dealing with the tar. You know, it's like, can't go out in shorts and a t shirt while doing this, you know? So it was a recipe for heat stroke for me. And pulling all that stuff up and down the ladders. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Not for me. We didn't have one of those like escalator ladder things to right. bring the supplies up. No, we actually had to use rope and pulley systems to bring the stuff up while climbing the ladder. Oh. And when it came to the fire paper and tar paper, we'd actually have to hold it on our shoulders while climbing up the ladder yeah. to get it up there too. Not me. I need both of my hands when I'm climbing ladders. I couldn't do one handed. There's no way. Yeah. Is you know, like, you want to know what, how the Egyptians felt building the pyramids? Become a roofer, <laughs> you know. But yeah, it's like, I didn't have the abilities, the strength, or the endurance to be a roofer. So it's like, yeah, I'm going to have to leave this job. Like, I, I, I'm just a liability in this field. Yeah, it takes a certain kind of person to be able to do that kind of job. Yeah, it does. Just like working retail takes a certain kind of person. And yeah, absolutely. And that's me. I am that kind of person who can handle working retail. Did you go into retail right after that roofing job? Not immediately after, but okay. pretty much, yeah. Like ever since high school, I'd been applying for retail jobs, you know, like okay. I applied at Toys R Us. I've applied at Blockbuster before they went under, you know, I applied at EB Games back when it was called EB Games. 
What's it called now? GameStop. Oh, okay. Same company, new name. I've never bought anything there. So I just, I just see it in passing sometimes. So it's understandable. Yeah. I've got a friend who works there. I have a friend who used to be a manager at the uh, South side one. We actually have the biggest store in Southwestern Canada. Oh. Both my friends say, yeah, this store is the biggest in Southwestern Canada. We get people coming in from Vancouver and Victoria Wow, because it's the biggest you know, and like people coming down from Calgary and Edmonton just to come to our store because they've got a bigger inventory. Don't they know it's supposed to be the other way around? We're the ones who are supposed to be going shopping in Edmonton and Calgary. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. I've been following along with what's been going on with GameStop ever since GameStop gate, when the GameStop stock started rising while Tesla stock was falling, Elon Musk went and made his big stink to the SEC saying, Hey, no fair. These people shouldn't be making all this much money in the stock markets. Every time someone tries to bring up investing in the stock markets or cryptocurrency or whatever, I immediately jump to GameStop gate and saying, hey, Elon Musk is not the hero you think he is. I don't know if you're familiar with the game Skyrim. I've never played it or anything, but yeah, I've heard of it. There's this one quest line for what's called the Bard's College quest line in one of the big cities, major holes. You go on this quest to help put on what's called, it's kind of like Burning Man, right? So they burn this effigy of a former king of Skyrim and former emperor of Tamriel. That's the name of the continent. They used to revere him as this great hero because he slayed the first dragon or something like that. The more you do go into it, the more you realize, actually, you know what? This guy isn't the hero that we claim him to be. He's actually really a bad guy. He did all this nasty stuff and just tried to take credit for it. So I kind of compare, you know, this guy of legend from the Skyrim to Elon Musk or well, vice versa. But I think I got a little sidetracked here. Um, you were talking about the re different retail jobs you applied. Oh, yes. Retail jobs. Off. Right. Yeah. So yeah, like EB Games, GameStop, I've applied to. I've applied to Culture Craze. I've applied, like, I've applied to a lot of places. I'm lucky if I can even get an interview. Yeah. And whatnot these days. It's really rough out there. Oh, yeah. Especially considering, like, you got a lot of these companies saying, oh, yeah, entry level position, but we want you to have X amount of experience. Yeah. It's like asking for someone who has not experienced the carnal arts to be experienced in the carnal arts. Yeah. I'm trying to make that as uh, media friendly <laughs> as I can. <laughs> So yeah, you know, like that's how it is. It's like, okay, you want experience in this field, but you want to pay them as if they're not experienced in it. Like make it make sense to us, you know, right. like yeah. you don't have to be autistic to realize that this doesn't make sense. And then of course, a lot of the jobs that I've applied to, it, they've given me reason why they haven't hired me, you know, and these are usually the ones where I do get the interview. Oh, okay. Like with Culture Craze, I applied there and the only obstacle in my way is my lack of reliable transportation to allow a broader range of availability on my part. Are they downtown? They are downtown in the mall. But uh, uh, since the new bus system was put in place, the 52 stops service at 7 p.m., Oh, I and see. I really don't okay. like the uh, ride on demand because it's like I have to book right when I need it. So it's like there's no guarantee that I can get to work on time if I have to go through it. You know, like right. under the old bus system, like I, I was an avid user and yeah, it may have been far from perfect, but it was more adequate than the system is now because all the buses ran 6 a.m. to midnight. So it gave us lots of opportunity to get everywhere. There was always a bus going to all the neighborhoods. I even talked to some of the veteran bus drivers and even they said, yeah, no, the old system was far from perfect. The only real issue with the old system was Route 22, but that's because during the day it went through the industrial park. Most of those people are working full-time jobs in there. So it's like, yeah, of course you're not going to have very high ridership in the industrial park. But Mayor Higgin, in his sense of reasoning, you know, said, well, you know what? We've got a hangnail, but let's just amputate the whole arm <laughs> kind of thing and just overhaul the whole bus system. Yeah. You've heard me speak ill of him in public before, but since this is a podcast, I'm trying to keep it as civil as possible. But anytime I have a comment directed right at him, where most people would say, with all due respect, I always make sure to say with full on disrespect. 
because I can't respect him as the head of the city. I've seen my fair share of mistakes made by Spearman, his predecessor. At least Spearman knew how to fix the mistake to not make it as bad as it could be. Sure. Whereas Higgin is just making it worse. And his way of thinking is still, I can run a business and running a city is just like running a business. And it's like, well, no. You know, the two are not the same thing. It actually takes more effort to run a city than it does to run a business because you're not just taking care of your business and your employees. You're taking care of 108,000 people and all their problems from infrastructure, like all the potholes to enforcing bylaws and, you know, like. I can get very inflamed in passion when talking about how messed up Lethbridge has become since Blaine Higgin became mayor. Yeah. All right, so you were talking about you were applying for a bunch of retail jobs. Yeah. And th that's actually been my biggest obstacle is my lack of reliable transportation and whatnot. And did you do anything in between that roofing job and Superstore? I just finished my first year of university Oh. Okay. Um, when I started my roofing job. Unfortunately, I flunked out of university. What were you studying? Archaeology and geology. Oh, nice. Well, actually, it was a double archaeology major. I would have gone for my Bachelor of Science in Archaeology and Geology, as well as my Bachelor of Arts in Archaeology. Okay. The UofL didn't have an actual archaeology program on its own, so it was kind of split up between the science department and the art department. So I just okay. went with that. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, I was not prepared for the total shift in school dynamic coming from high school and going into university. Because in high school, while I had a bunch of assignments to help bolster my grade, you know, first year of university, it's mostly exams and quizzes to hold my grade up. And it's just, I was completely taken by surprise and ill-prepared. And even if you're doing papers, they're on a completely different level than high school papers. Definitely. Yeah. I've always been pretty bad at writing essays and term papers and whatnot, even in high school. Like throughout high school, my absolute best paper was just one point shy of 100%. And that's because I put a comma where one wasn't needed. Oh, my goodness. It was in grade 11 English class. And the subject was on Lord of the Flies. And you lost a percentage point because of it? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I still pulled off a 99 on it. It's just that one errant comma. That's ruthless. Oh, it was. But oh my goodness. I was ecstatic. Sure, of course. Because we were given a list of topics. And the topic I went with was descent into chaos through the lack of rules. As an ANCOM myself, I know the importance of rules, but I also know the importance of being flexible with those rules right. so we don't fall into authoritarianism. But at the same time, without those rules, we descend beyond anarchy into chaos. Yeah. Mine was on the purview of what happens when there are no rules, you know, and everything just falls into chaos. And for an 11th grade paper, it was so well written that it's like, I can't believe this came from me. But at the same time, it's like, hell yeah. Sure. Give me a topic that I know so much about. I could give you a PhD thesis on this. Yeah. And then in that same breath, ask me to recite, you know, like a soliloquy from Hamlet. And it's like, um, line, line. <laughs> <laughs> so you were doing one year of university while you were on that roofing job. Actually, no, it was after. Oh, after. I finished my second semester when I started the roofing job. Okay. All right. So basically just after I flunked out, I started the roofing job, did the roofing job for one week. So that was in 2007. Took a little bit of time off, met with a psychiatrist for a little bit who helped me get onto AISH. Okay. I was still putting my resume out there, you know, looking for jobs, bolster my pay and fill the time so I'm not going stir crazy and all that. Uh, and then in 2008, I was doing upgrading at the college to upgrade my biology, chemistry, and mathematics so that I could try university again in a different field, Okay, uh, which was going to be zoology. Oh, nice. I was reading the tie-in novel to the Spider-Man comics called Spider-Man Goblin Moon. It got me thinking about the character Kurt Connors, aka the lizard, and thinking... You know what? In the evolutionary scheme of things, humans 
really aren't that far off yet from reptiles. So maybe comparing reptile DNA to human DNA, I could figure out which of our dormant genes are the reptilian ones. And maybe I could reactivate our ability to regrow limbs, lost limbs or something. Oh, that's cool. So it's kind of like become a geneticist by way of zoology kind of thing. Yeah. You know, like accidents happen. You know, an aspiring ballerina loses her leg in a car crash, right? And so she's not able to perform anymore, you know? And like, if she was able to regrow that leg and including the nerves and all that so that she could be a ballerina when she grows up, you know, like, I'd like to give those people that chance. Yeah. But at the same time, I also know how it could be corrupted for for other use, you know, like use in the military and whatnot. And like, I'm not out to create super soldiers. That's what I was inadvertently turned into as a teenager with the different psychological medication cocktail that I was on. No, I don't wish that on anyone. What I do wish is for people who have a dream to get the chance to experience that dream. And especially like people born with diabetes, you know, because they lost the gene for a functional pancreas or whatever, you know, like if I could find a way to give them a brand new functional pancreas. But I mean, like they say, the highway to hell is paved with good intentions. Yes. <laughs> All right. So you went back to the college? Yeah, I went to the college and I also flunked out there. Okay. I was exceptional in the biology and chemistry part. But when I was taking my grade 12 math class, that's kind of where things started to fall apart because that's where I realized that I had dyscalculia. It's like dyslexia, but for numbers, especially with trigonometry and algebraic parts. It's like the more complex the algebraic equations got, the worse my dyscalculia became. Okay. There was also some stuff that my autism just wouldn't let me grasp because it didn't make sense to my autism. When it came to doing the square roots of negative values and calculating whether the value is going to come out to one or one I, my brain couldn't grasp, okay, how am I going to use this in the real world? I'm not wanting to become a math teacher or anything. So how is this actually going to be useful to me? Right. Balancing the equations though, oh man, I could do that in my sleep. <laughs> Still can actually. And so what did you do after the college? After the college, I kind of fell back into my rut of applying for jobs, getting rejected, and making the best of life as I could while on AISH, trying to get my foot in the door to get some kind of a job in, in retail. And then COVID struck, and that's kind of when my life started falling apart again. Before COVID, I was hanging out like three, four times a week with my friends. You know, like going to round table two times a week to play D&D, &D, right. going over to one a friend's house for board games on Sundays, going over to another friend's house to play Starfinder. And then COVID struck and that's when all hell broke loose. I can't afford to live my life like this. So my mom, who was then working at Superstore at the time, helped me get the job at Superstore because uh, they had the uh, refer a friend program where if they referred someone to apply, they would get a $50 bonus. $50. Yeah. Uh, so I said, you know what? It's not my ideal retail job, but it's something. So I applied, I got the job, did a hell of a job in December. And then to get the phone call at the beginning of January saying, you know, we can't afford to keep you on. And this was just after Jason Kenney gave them a $5 billion bailout, even though Loblaws was recording $20, 25000000000 billion in record profits. Yeah. This is the event that's happening. And then these are all the different tangents that are happening because of that point. No money for the other uh, government programs. So Jason Kenney had to cut funding to those programs to help balance the budget and all that because he gave out this bailout money to Weston, even though he didn't need it. And so rather than saying, this is not a gift, you will have to pay this back. It's like, oh yeah, this is a gift because we're all buddy buddies. But actually when I found out that Kenny and Kalen Weston actually are buddy buddies. I also found out that it was because of Kenny back when he was working for Stephen Harper, that it was Kenny who made it so that PayPal is the only viable money transferring service to be used in Canada because Kenny went to school with Elon Musk. Well, that, that's why we can't have like the cash app. And yeah, that's why ones. we can't have cash app and all those other 
money transfer things because Elon uh, Elon Musk was controlling member of PayPal and being buddy buddies with Jason Kenney. Jason Kenney made the policy while he was working under Stephen Harper and it just snowballed from there. Yeah. And so you we finished at the Superstore in the summer of 2022. Is that right? 2021. 2021. So you started in December 2020 and then finished in the summer of 2021. Okay. Now that we got all caught up. Um, <laughs> Because I left because the work environment in the meat department became too toxic. Sure. But on top of learning that Kenny had given Loblaws a $5 billion bailout, we had also been going on three years without contract with our union. Oh. A lot of my veteran coworkers there, they hadn't gotten a raise in over three years. And by contract, we were supposed to be getting a raise every six months. There had been people working there five, 10 years without getting a single raise to begin with. By contract, we are supposed to be getting a raise every six months. I don't know how, how far back you, if you remember this, but I remember on one of your posts, I got into it with a pro-capitalist guy who had the top follower badge for you. I don't choose who gets those. That's Facebook chooses those. <laughs> Yeah, I I follow a lot of admins who who have that too, you know, like some of them are trans pages. You see a lot of these trans folks that have top fan badges and all that and it's like yeah. <laughs> ugh, Facebook, you're quite a piece of work and I don't mean that in a good way. <laughs> but yeah, and like he was telling me that like when we apply for a job as an employee, we are essentially signing a contract to do the job at the pay that we agree upon agree upon and it's like okay well if having a job is a contract and if said contract says that the employer has to give the employee a raise every so often or something then an employee asking for a raise would not actually be a violation of the contract because the employer already violated the contract by not providing said obligatory raise Right. I've seen a lot of these people coming to the defense of capitalism and trying to victim blame the employees and whatnot and like saying all this stuff that while technically true is also ignoring the flip side of that. You know, if working for someone is a contract, it's a two way street, not a one way street. You know, responsibility doesn't all fall on the employee. The employer also has some responsibilities there, not just to the business, but to the employees. Of course. All right. So then what have you been up to since Superstore? Uh, since Superstore, once again, I've fallen back into the same rut of applying for jobs and getting rejected. Yeah, and this is not the best time to be applying for jobs. No, it is not. But I have some chosen family who live down in Florida, and they're planning on opening up their own restaurant. They already have a job opening for me if I ever get down there, and they are willing to sponsor me to work in their restaurant. Oh, wow. Okay. That'd be cool. Yeah, so. Not retail, but sounds like it'd be a pretty neat place. Well, I mean, it wouldn't be like working for McDonald's or something like that. You know, it'd be a family owned business that I'm working for. Like I said, they're my chosen family. You know, the one family member I've known since 2017. Oh, wow. Okay. She and I are as close as sisters, you know, so it's an opportunity that I am not going to pass up on. Sure. It'll be a big change. It'll either work out or it won't, but I won't know until I take that plunge. So that's what I'm doing. Yeah. And yeah, I may be moving to Florida, but as things are going here in Alberta, I'll take my chances in Florida over Alberta because... It might not be any worse down there. It might not be any worse, no, but it might prove to be better. Yeah. We'll see how things look here by the end of the year. You're friends with some of my friends too on Facebook and whatnot, so... Okay. I don't know if my nom de guerre for Danielle Smith has made it to your ears, but I like to refer to her as Empress Palpatine. Mm. Everything she's been doing is so comparable to Palpatine from Star Wars, manipulating everything to get her way until eventually she takes over and instills her own regime. You know, like she'll butt heads with Trudeau over provincial sovereignty, you know, and then in that same breath, she'll turn around and, you know, manipulate Saskatchewan and BC into doing policies that she wants even though they don't affect her in any way whatsoever, you know? And then with her Bill 20, where she's trying to establish control over the municipalities, which I understand has had some recent amendments. I haven't had time to look into those yet. I've been struggling with my own kind of emotional turmoil right now. So it's like, okay, well, you know, as long as Bill 20 doesn't go through, I'll be happy. I'm seeing everything that Daniel Smith has been doing, and it's just... 
I really don't want to be here when it all hits the fan. And it's because it's going to make a big mess Sure. because I know I'm not going to react well to it. Okay. You know, my, my reaction will be similar to the goth sacking Rome. All right. So we are at today now. So that's your life history or your personal labor history. So now I have a question for you that I ask all of my guests. How has your intersections of marginalization influenced your experiences as a worker? And that could be, you know, gender, orientation, ethnicity, economic class, religion, you know, stuff like that. For the most part, it's been okay. The only difficult part was with my ASM working at Superstore when I was in the meat department, with him not recognizing that my autism plays a huge part in my efficiency. Right. That like, if I'm struggling to do my job because I also have to pick up the slack from someone else's job, make this make sense to me. How am I supposed to pick up the slack of the person who didn't complete their job the day before while not creating slack on my end? It's basically like, a lack of proper understanding on my part, which also comes from when I transferred to the meat department, I was actually only half trained because oh. the associate department head who was training me ended up quitting the next day after he trained me. Really? Yeah. Like I said, the meat department had high overhead and that included department heads and associate department heads. So it's like for the four months that I was working in the meat department, I had one day with an associate department head and all four months without a department head. So it's like, okay, no wonder he's on a power trip. You know, he thinks he knows what's what. And it's like, he's trying to treat it like he's running the whole store rather than stepping back from the associate store manager role and thinking about it from a department head point of view. Right. Yeah. He was micromanaging just a little too much. That really wreaked havoc with my autism. Yeah. As for other parts of being a member of marginalized community, never had too much flack for being pagan. I dropped Catholicism like halfway through high school, even tried to start my own pagan religion that worshiped reptiles oh. back in <laughs> grade 11, grade 12. It didn't get a lot of traction, so I gave up on that. A few years later, I had some unexplainable events happen in my life that made me consider the more established pagan religions. Okay. My autism said, you know what? This actually makes a lot more sense. Okay. So I'm just going to run with it. So now I practice witchcraft and I worship Aphrodite, Artemis, and Athena. So or as I call them, the daughters of Zeus. Okay, cool. And haven't had much flack with that. Haven't had a whole lot of flack from being a trans lesbian. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, well, I mean, not yet, of course, at least not in of the course. workplace. Yeah, yeah. But so far. Not too bad. But I know there's a lot of places that would give me flack. Of course. So I have avoided applying to those places. Yeah. If they're not inclusive, they're not getting my resume. Yeah, no doubt. All right. Well, cool. Uh, any final thoughts for our listeners? Actually, yeah. I had this epiphany over the weekend after engaging with someone who tried to compare capitalism to some beneficial thing, but I was thinking about it and like, no, your analogy is actually wrong. Late stage capitalism is more comparable to being back in high school, where the faculty is the government, lobbyists are the PTA, and then the rest of us are the cliques all just playing our roles, right? So you've got the right. popular kids, aka corporate executives. They're the popular kids, the jocks, the preppies. And then you've got like the wannabes, which would be landlords and upper middle class people trying to live beyond their means. And then you've got your members of the school band, you've got your artists, your thespians, your shop kids, your trades kids, you know, you've got your loners, you've got your burnouts, you know, and then you've got what I was in high school, which is the chameleons, ones who don't fit in in just one group, yeah. but feel like they don't belong to that group either but they blend in so well with that group yeah you know if you're going to try to compare late stage capitalism to anything compare it to high school and you know and like i've posted it to a lot of leftist groups that i belong to and on leftist pages that i follow and the feedback has been really good on that comparison oh, okay cool good analogy all right um yeah so is there 
anywhere if people are interested in following you and you know learning a little bit more about you and and the work that you do if like if you have public social media accounts or a website or you know anything like that uh yeah if anyone's interested in following me you can follow me on instagram and threads under the handle ruby the suicide queen all one word on both on both yeah because okay. they're both through meta oh right yeah of course yeah <laughs> You can follow me on TikTok. I don't post a whole lot of content on TikTok though, but you can follow me on TikTok under TF Avenger. Okay. And if anyone wants to kind of take a dive into my musical tastes, you can follow me on Spotify at Ruby Saturday. Cool. All right. I'll make sure to put those in the episode description below. And if people are interested in following the Alberta Worker, you can find us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And you can also visit our website at albertaworker.ca. And while you're there, you might as well sign up for our email newsletter. We have daily, weekly, and monthly options. If you like this episode and our interview with Ruby, please rate and review this episode. Please support the Alberta Worker podcast. Uh, the Alberta Worker and this podcast depend on the financial contribution of our gracious listeners just like you. If you want to be a guest on the Alberta Worker podcast, please email us at podcast.albertaworker.ca or send us a DM on our social media. Thank you so much, Ruby, for joining us today. And thank you to the listeners for tuning in. And as always, solidarity. Solidarity.